So mm. talk us through a little more generally self-mastery in the context mm. of becoming exceptional. Yeah. You know, a lot of a lot of what I learned, you know, coming to America as a refugee is that you're not going to always have those opportunities that are maybe available to others. And I learned, you know, my parents, my father was working as a waiter in Miami Beach. My mom was working as a, a waitress. You came that, when you were eight years old. I came when I was eight. I didn't speak English. Um, and you, you have to become self-reliant and say to yourself, okay, I can't afford to buy books. Where can I find them? I used to find them in garbage cans. I used to uh, ask people, hey, can I have that magazine if, if, if you're done with it? Self-mastery, I have seen it in so many places. I've traveled all over the world. I've, I've been in, in, in places in Bogota, Colombia, where you know people sleep under plastic tarps at night in fields. And the thing that they value is an, is an education. And I've realized that we can self-educate. You know, when, when Joseph Campbell, the, the great uh, uh, mythologist, uh, talked about finding your bliss, he, he wasn't thinking about, he wasn't saying, well, you just sit in a chair, fan yourself, and your bliss will come to you. He says you have to put an effort into it. But he said there's something magical about it, that when we do put an effort into it, that doors opened up. I didn't set out to study body language. I, I studied body language because I found it essential to be able to communicate because I didn't speak English. Then I continued in those efforts that I read everything that I could and not just in psychology because body language is something that nobody owns. Psychologists think they own it, but they don't. It comes to, you know, anthropologists, sociologists, ethnologists, ethologists, um, all sorts of sciences contribute to it. Historians con contribute. You, if you read Herodotus, you read about body language. If you read about Captain Cook arriving in the Pacific Islands, you're a, a mile out. He's reading the body language of, of the people there, and he says, that's the leader. <laughs> A mile out. We can create a, 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 a master program for ourselves. We can apprentice ourselves. And it's with that effort, we can become something totally different. And that's what uh, Joseph Campbell was talking about, that we can create this. We can find that bliss. And, uh, but it requires effort on our part. What was it? That, think, what was it that Marcus Aurelius said? You, you, uh, you, well, you, you quote him in the book and it's something along the lines of, you know, if, if, if it's something that you want to do, it's likely that it's possible. And if it's possible, go and do it along those lines. It, no, it, it, exactly right. Well, there's so many from, I, I, I actually have 13 pages of Marcus Aurelius quotes. But basically what he said is, if you can imagine it, if you can act in furtherance of it, then it can be done. And, and that's the essence of it. And what I find is exceptional people um, go out of their way to to learn what needs to be done i've talked to to farmers who um seek the knowledge of others that maybe they can't find it in a book but it's but it's carried in the the oral traditions of these little places in missouri where they, they they're not going to read a book on how to farm but they can grow okra because they talk to each other and they share that 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 that, that knowledge and, um, and, and like I said, you know, Bill Gates himself, you know, he, he creates something really out of nothing. I mean, we could certainly, we could go back to Babbage and, and the, the first computer and, and, uh, and, and so forth. And we build on, on the knowledge of others, on the shoulders of others. But in the end, 
it is still possible to create something wonderful for ourselves, but we have to apprentice ourselves to doing something about it, and whether it's, it's reading or, or learning. It's, it's partly about not making excuses for yourself, isn't it? You didn't make excuses for yourself as an eight-year-old boy who only spoke Spanish. You were looking for books in, in, in the garbage in the garbage can. And it's about opportunity as well, but creating opportunities. Think of the dog walker, the famous dog walker that you, you tell us about, who discovers this spur and he takes it back and has a look at it under the microscope. And what comes out of that? Velcro in the middle of World War II. In the middle of World War II. You'd think there were other priorities. He's out walking his dog. He gets his, this burr on his, on his foot on his leg on his sock his dog has it can't hardly pull it off he puts it under a microscope and he looks at the architecture here's where you have curiosity and he looks at it and he says well we can replicate this i can replicate this it takes time it took him 10 years right so there's that focus and that dedication but he goes and creates velcro the, one of the one of the few things other than maybe duct tape that has been on every space flight it's something we all use everything around here has 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 duct tape on it and we owe it to the curiosity of one individual I, it you know it doesn't matter this i took you know as you know in the book i write about this lovely woman i, I think now she she has passed away i i've sent queries out and they haven't been returned in brazil in Brazil, brings 12 children that we know of into this world. She's blind from the time she's three or four, but she does um, uh, this craft where this needlework, and she does it through field by field. She can feel the, the fabric and she can count the threads. It, it, was, it was breathtaking to, to watch her do it. And she, she had taught herself, uh, her mother had helped her, but she passed away. But it was her ability to observe the world around her. She could sense when a window was open because the hairs on her arm would move in a certain direction. She could tell what position we were in as we were sitting and she, she couldn't see. And you could tell that everything about her was not egocentric, not self-centered, but the world around her. Who's comfortable? Who needs this? Who needs that? And that is exceptional. That is mirrored in another experience that you had, Joe, when you were in, I, I think, the foyer of a, a supermarket or a mall, as you might call it in America, and you were talking to the manager. And the manager darts off and he goes and attends to two people. It might have been a hotel, I think. And, and it was. And, and, he, and he comes back and you say, that was quick. And he says. He says, if I had waited for them to go to the front desk, we wouldn't have been doing our job. This was at the Ritz Carlton in Sarasota. We're, we're talking in the hallway. He sees some people come out of the elevator and from their body language, he says, they, they, he could tell they were looking for something. And he says, I fail. I fail as a, as a manager and I fail as an institution if we have to wait for them to come to the front desk to ask for help. I mean, he just took off, goes right to them and says, how can I help you? You seem lost. They were looking for the exit to, uh, to, to the pool. That's exceptional. Imagine if, we, if everywhere you went, people did that. You know, when I tell executives, you, you tell me you have, a, you know, your, your organization is exceptional. Really? Because when I got here, I had, to, I had trouble finding parking. I had to deal with security. I had to deal with your front desk. I had to come upstairs and find you, your office. What if you had just come downstairs and met me downstairs. If you say you value me so much, what if you had been downstairs and said, welcome, Mr. Navarro, and walk me through that, 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 that whole maze? What a difference. You know what the difference is? 
psychological comfort. Humans don't want perfection. We don't care if it's a teddy bear or if it's a, a, a dirty rag. Humans seek psychological comfort. And whoever provides that the soonest wins. And, and we, I could, hear the, we yeah. could read across, can't we, from the professional world into our personal lives as well, because this is about observation. It's about observing other people, which puts us in a stronger position, both to help ourselves, but also to help them. And it's about empathy. It's about trying to put ourselves in their shoes. Talk to us, if you would, a little more generally about the importance, if you are seeking to become exceptional or do exceptional things, the importance of observation. It sits in the book between self-mastery and communication. We've touched on some communication. We'll come back to communication. But for the moment, observation is critical and it's critical as well to that next step of communication. Clearly. The only way to differentiate yourself, the only way left to differentiate yourself, because you have the same software I do. Maybe you use Microsoft Word, I use Microsoft Word, you use Excel. I, the only way it left is, is how we act, how we perform, the nonverbals. We need to be able to, if you wanna be exceptional, right? And, and I mean that in, in a way that is truly influential you need to be able to observe in real time what are the needs what are the wants what are the desires what are the fears and concerns of others because we transmit that non-verbally right we we transmit concerns fears when 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 you see a little child looking in a window at candy and he's leaning forward right He's revealing what he cherishes. You know, if I keep looking at my watch, you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to, to say, well, maybe there's a time issue here. The person that quickly identifies those things and then rises to act so that we can then be taken care of. Do you need to go? What, what is it that's bothering you? Let's talk about it. You can't be empathetic. I would argue it's impossible to be empathetic if you are not a good observer. It's either going to come too late or it's not going to come at all. Could you give us a brief example, Joe, of a, being a good observer in a, in, in a potentially life and death situation? I mean, as I said, you worked in the FBI for 25 years or so. And you had to use great powers of observation in order to make the situation safer than it would otherwise have been for those who were trying to help and also those in your command. There was an incident several years ago. I, I, I like to go uh, swim at the, at the YMCA. I don't, I don't know if you have those in, in, the, uh, in the UK, but they're great family places. They, they have gyms and they have pools. And I was routinely going swimming. And there was a, a child there that I, I noticed uh, anytime the mother came to, to pick her up, her arms would immediately come to her side and she just changed her whole countenance. She became sort of stoic and sometimes even dour. She put, would put her chin down. And I thought, this is really unusual. Most kids are happy to see their, their parents, but this child um, grew stoic around um, her, her, her mother. And one day I just happened to be um, coming out of the pool and getting my things. And I noticed that the mother was pinching her to move along. And I said, I've had enough. And uh, so this was, was reported to, uh, to the YMCA and it was reported to, to the authorities. And as it turns out, um, uh, this, this mother was abusing uh, th this child. This is based on just two behaviors. The stoicism, the restricted arm behavior that I've seen, this uh, fear response, and then this, uh, this, this particular behavior. Now, <laughs> you know, I've also seen a, a, a lot of period uh, 
uh, films where people used to pinch each other a lot and nobody seemed to, uh, to, to mind that, that too much. But here was, uh, here was something that was staring me in, in the face. I couldn't turn away from it. I had to do something about it. And, and it was based on, uh, on, on the nonverbals. Um, I hope that this helped that child. I hope it helped that family. I, I hope that it, it, it made some changes. But what if I had not observed those things? And I, and I look back on, on, on my career at, 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 at little things. I had an espionage case where um, I was interviewing an individual who was supposed to be a witness. And yet, as he smoked a cigarette, when, he mentioned, when I mentioned the name of someone that had been arrested in Germany, his cigarette shook. Obviously, not all words have the same weight. And that led to further interviews and eventually his confession. Observation, the, the ability to observe matters. The, the woman in Brazil who was blind and could hear that I had put the, the spoon down on, on the, in the demitasse, she realized I didn't have a napkin just from the sounds. And so she sent her daughter to get me a napkin. She is attending to me. Observation is so key to innovation, to novelty, to being able to see what are the needs. You, you cannot act effectively if you can't observe diligently. And that's, and that's why it's such a prominent place in, in the book, the ability to observe. And indeed, we were talking in the virtual green room, I was asking you about self-defense and what they taught you there. And if you observe someone very closely, you might be able to see whether they're going to come at you with a left first or a right first. These sorts of things, as I said earlier, can be a matter of life and death. I want to move on to communication. Mm -hmm. So you were a specialist in body language when you were at the FBI and you described right. some of the journey that you've gone on in order to become a specialist. Right. Can you again give us a broad sense of how important it is to communicate and how interaction can become transaction? Uh, yeah, great, great question. Ask anybody in business, what's the, the number one issue in business is lack of communication. When, when uh, you know, we assume that communication is, is mostly verbal. In fact, in fact, most of the communication that we do is nonverbal. How we assess for uh, when a baby is born for the next year and a half, that's almost 100% nonverbal. When you're at an ATM machine and you're getting your money out and you're looking around, you're assessing non-verbally. This is, this is communication. Mate selection. We base mate selection not on how well they did at school. We do it on how they... Uh, you know, don't ever tell your, 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 your spouse it was based on their you know, CV. It's, it's everything a, 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 about them. We use communication all day long. And in business how often it is about that tone of voice. It is about how much face time. It is about somebody reaching out to you and saying, how's your day? How's that project going? I, do you need help? It's, it's the, you know, everything that fits under nonverbals, which is everything that communicates, but is not a word, is 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 a huge thing think about how many times somebody comes up and puts her arm on, on your back you know the difference between a full palm and uh, and just fingertips um, things like this that communicate empathy that communicate care um, in organizations you know we look at frequency of contact we look at duration of contact but we also look at the emotional contact, right? Was this, was this all clinical? Was this all transactional? 
or where's the emotion? Turns out that when there's positive emotions involved, frequency of contact, duration of contact is potentiated by the emotional, by the positive emotions that, that are, are, are transmitted. So we cannot escape it, right? Even in the virtual world, when we went virtual back in March of last year, what was the first concern everybody told me about? I can't read them. They're wearing masks or I can only see their face. And all of a sudden body language was what well, we needed. <laughs> I, I had executives calling me and say, I, I can't read their body language. I'm supposed to hire this person. And all I, I, all I can see is this. And, and, and you realize, oh, wow. Maybe we have been counting on body language. We just didn't know it. Because this is how we assess for skill. This is how we assess for personality. This is how we assess for trustworthiness. You don't ask people, hey, Matthew, by the way, are you trustworthy? No, but we're assessing it. We're assessing it by how quickly you respond, how honest you appear to be. All these things contribute to it. And it's all based on the nonverbals. You're like a sort of human lie detector. I'm curious to, I'm curious to look, <laughs> for you to give us some of the examples that you offer us in the book yeah. about what certain movements, what yeah. certain touches, what, what they indicate. I mean, just for example, an obvious one where we furrow the brows suggests this. Yeah. But when we, when we touch our eyelids, for example. So...